after dying on the cross. Because of that, Lord, we get to spend eternity with you if we choose to follow you. Lord, if anyone is watching from home or is even here today that does not know you or maybe has forgotten your name, Lord, we pray that you introduce yourself today. Remind us that the words that we sing today, the focus that we give you during the sermon, the thoughts that we have in our minds, our actions, everything is for you and for you alone. Allow the songs that we sing to praise you and honor you. It's an honor to sing your praises every day, and we pray that you remind us to go tell it on the mountain, over the hills, and everywhere that Jesus Christ did, in fact, come to earth. We love you so much, and we thank you for bringing us here safely today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Will you please stand if you're able as we begin our time in singing as we sing, Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills, and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Let's continue singing together as we sing Glory to God Forever. Your great imagination 
matchless name all my days, all my days, so that my whole life be a blazing offering, a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God. to God forever. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Take my life and let it be As we turn our attentions to the screen, um, we invite you to uh, listen to God's word in a special Advent reading. Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18 says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means proceed those who have died. For the Lord himself, with the cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We have heard of the saying, the gift that keeps on giving. It is great to receive a gift. It is even better to receive a gift which keeps going and going. This may be why clubs for the book, fruit, or stake of the month are popular. We like to continue to have something to look forward to, to anticipate, Another word for anticipate is hope. Receiving a gift is wonderful. Receiving a gift full of hope is even better. The word Advent means coming. We celebrate the coming of Jesus as a gift to the world. Yet, at his first coming, he also promised a second event, his coming again. Paul told the Thessalonians to encourage one another by reminding each other of the day when Christ would come again. He gives us a hope that Jesus would not come just once, but would come again. Jesus gives us a wonderful gift full of hope. He came first to die on the cross and rise again to defeat death. He says today by the power of the Holy Spirit, he stands at the door, knocks, waiting for us to receive him. We can look with anticipation at the day when we will meet him in the clouds and welcome him back to earth to reign forever. Jesus is the gift who keeps on giving. We want to thank Rick and Joyce Evans for uh, sharing that word with us and uh, our plan and 
throughout the Advent season, throughout the Christmas season here, is to have different individuals from the church. Maybe some people that you have not seen, people you have worshipped with, uh, who you haven't seen in eight or nine months. It is hard to believe that we have gone uh, that length of time, many people not being with us in the sanctuary. We want to welcome those who are. We want to welcome you if you are online with us today and worshiping our Lord Jesus Christ as we enter the season where we celebrate Jesus' birth. And uh, it gives us great joy and thanksgiving. There's some things that we're going to be doing during the Christmas season. Uh, one is on December 12th at 2 p.m., Back in the parking lot, we're going to have an, a drive-in Christmas concert. So different people are going to sing or do some readings uh, or uh, share with you some Christmas carols uh, that we can come together and celebrate as a church, especially for you who are uh, not yet comfortable coming back into the sanctuary to worship together. Uh, but if you want to drive in, stay in your car, drink your hot chocolate, eat your Christmas cookies, uh, bring those yourselves, and enjoy seeing and hearing uh, some of your brothers and sisters in Christ uh, singing praise to God at Jesus' coming. So I invite you to that December 12th at 2 p.m. Also for the church, uh, online, uh, starting tomorrow at 8 a.m., uh, you can go to either the Duber Church uh, YouTube page or to our Facebook page, either one of those. Uh, each morning between now and Christmas, except for Sundays, we have different people from the church who have made some Advent devotional videos. So if you want to get on there, see a familiar face, hear what the coming of Jesus means to them and why Christmas is such a special uh, part of their walk with Jesus Christ and their life with God, uh, you can get on and we'll have a different video up each day between now and Christmas to help you celebrate uh, the Christmas season and also see some people that you haven't seen in a while, possibly. Uh, finally, our last uh, sort of announcement. Um, this is uh, just a little bit different. Uh, Christmas Eve, we have plans to have worship uh, on our normal Christmas Eve times, 5 and 7, and also possibly at 9.30 if need be. Uh, part of our uh, challenge, our hope to figure out how we're going to do Christmas Eve in the midst of a pandemic and uh, part of our ability to plan well involves you helping us to know when you're coming. So we're going to ask you to go online, or we're going to have some things in the bulletin, or you could just call the office. And we're not saying you have to register. You don't have to register to come to, to worship. We don't want people to, to feel like you had to RSVP to come to church and to celebrate Christmas. Uh, we are asking if you could let us know your plans. Uh, wouldn't you feel comfortable coming? What service you might be coming to? Uh, how many people might be coming with your family that night? That would be a, a great help to John and myself as we try to figure out uh, how we will have services, but also keep people feeling safe. We want everyone to come on that evening uh, to arrive at worship with a heart for worship, not a heart that is partially here for worship and partially concerned about how close I'm going to have to sit to somebody and I don't know who this is or where they've come from. We, we don't want people to worry about the, the virus on Christmas Eve. We want them to just to be able to enjoy the coming of Jesus Christ and, and to celebrate that. So if you could let us know your plans, that would be a huge help to us in planning for Christmas Eve. And you can do that going online, as we said, in, in the coming weeks. Uh, we'll have things in the bulletin about that. And then you could also simply just call the office and, and tell them when you plan on coming. Uh, if you have those plans made, that would be a great help to us. You have been a great help to us. The whole church has as we have gone through this pandemic. And uh, the church has not had to worry about our finances at all because of the faithfulness of the giving of people at Duber Church. And we are thankful for your commitment your obedience to God's call to be people who are generous and give to others. And we've been able to continue much of our work, uh, many things, um, without any hiccup because of your giving. Our street ministry, our youth ministry, uh, even our child evangelism good news club with Duber Elementary has gone on um, in the midst of the pandemic uh, because of your generosity. Duber Kids Club as well, our tutoring program. We want to thank you for supporting all those and uh, 
uh, just remind you of God's call for us to be generous people, not just with our finances, but with our whole lives. How can we still find places to love others, to give of ourselves to God and others in the midst of the pandemic? Let's take a moment and just pray to God. Ask Him for a vision and how we can do that today. Father God, we are thankful for the willingness of so many people to serve you, to be obedient to your call, to reveal to the world what it looks like when Christ is the king of someone's life. And when we pray in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Father God, we want to show the world what it is for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Show us how we can live out our calling as people of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Show us how we can be generous with our finances, generous with our time, our energy, with our love, with all our being. Father God, we offer ourselves to you as living sacrifices to be used for your glory and honor and for the love of others that they might find salvation in Jesus Christ. Lord God, we ask your grace and your goodness to be poured out upon us so that we can be that blessing. Help us to be faithful in our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you can stand and let's continue to sing our Lord's praises this morning.
You want to turn in your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 6. That's where we're going to be this morning. We're going to read the first eight verses. We're going to also uh, look at some different parts of the different verses in that chapter. Looking today at our need for a king. At our 845 service this morning, we sang... Uh, come thou long expected Jesus. And in that there is a line, born a child and yet a king. We're going to spend our Christmas preaching, uh, our sermon time, talking about the king and his kingdom who has come to earth. Born a child, Jesus the king. Jesus spent much of his ministry talking about the kingdom coming, uh, it, the kingdom being at hand talked about his messianic reign as king. Christmas is a major event in that when Christ comes to earth to take reign, to rule over creation. He inaugurates his kingdom, comes to this earth with a demonic evil power that, that affects so many lives. It affects the whole world that the scriptures talk about Satan reigning in the, this earth the prince of the power of the air, and Christ coming to inaugurate his kingdom, his reign, his rule. And that begins with our lives. This morning we want to start talking about that and saying, what is the need? Why do we have a need for Jesus, not just to be our, our Savior, but our King? Why do we need a King to come? A King for our hearts, a King for our lives. We see that in Genesis chapter 6. It says, when the people began to multiply on the face of the ground, the daughter and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw that they were fair, and they took wives for themselves, for of all that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went into the daughters of humans who bore children to them, these were the heroes that were of old warriors of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, people together with animals and creeping things, the birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. These two groups that are talked about here in, in Genesis 6 that kind of make us wonder who they are. Who are the, the, the Nephilim? Uh, Nephilim literally means the, the fallen one. Uh, fallen angels or, or fallen man. The, the focus really is here of fallen nature. That we're in Genesis chapter 6, only a few chapters ago, Genesis chapter 3, we still see Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden where God had made things not just good, but he says very good. But then there's the fall. Sin and evil come into the world. And we see a, a fallen nature. Now, fallen nature, even these sons of God. Some would say that these sons of God are, are angels who have come down from heaven to procreate with the women of the earth. But the Bible tells us in the New Testament that the angels don't do that. The angels don't procreate. They don't have enter into marriage. So they're not angels that we see. But, but these sons of God are men, but, but likely men 
who are affected, who are oppressed, who are maybe demonized by fallen angels. We see throughout the scriptures, and especially in Jesus' life and his ministry, we see that demonic forces want to embody physical beings. We see that especially Jesus casts out many demons out of one man, and when the demons are coming out, they ask Jesus if if they can go into a a herd of pigs. They want to stay in in some kind of physical being. They want to take up residence. And they especially want to take up residence in people to have influence and control over them. And not influence and control as we sometimes imagine. Much of our ideas of of the demonic come from just small places in the Bible, places where it talks about man living in the cemetery and and living like a wild man or or a a young boy who would cast himself in the fire. We get these ideas and and then we look at modern day horror films and we have ideas of what demonic control looks like. But more often we see Satan and, and his armies, his angels who followed him, and falling from God, they rule in in ways that seem very attractive to the world. They want to lead through convincing us of things that we think we want, self-gratification. Look at how Satan convinces Eve in the first sin in in Genesis chapter 3, where he makes her believe, he gets her to believe that this fruit, this disobedience from to God is, is going to make her like God. That her and Adam both have this desire and think that this is their desire, but really Satan manipulates them, tempts them, deceives them into following his bidding, doing what he wants them to do. Demonic powers work in the world in in a very similar way, through greed, through lust, through a desire for power, through ideas of pride or racism. These demonic forces work in the world to get us to think that we're doing what we desire, but in actuality, we are following their instruction We see it here in Genesis chapter 6 in a couple ways. Ways that humanity has fallen away from God's intention and His call. One, in their rejection of God's idea of marriage and their devaluation of marriage. It says in verse 2 that the men took wives of all that they chose. They didn't just choose one wife, but of all the wives that they chose. They chose as many wives as they could find. It wasn't just about a committed covenant relationship, but it was about this idea that if I have more wives and I show my sexual prowess and I have many children, then my name's going to be renowned and glorified. And these evil controlling forces wanted people to believe in this, that that life was about self-glorification or about renown. Verse 4 says, these were the heroes that were of old, warriors, of renown. We think that, sometimes we think that sounds like a, a positive thing. These warriors of renown. But the scripture goes on to say in verse 5 that God saw it. The wickedness of humankind was great on the earth and every inclination of their thoughts was evil continually. That God looked on these heroes of renown and he didn't see great heroes who were fighting just wars and, and saving people's lives, but These were individuals who were warriors of renown, known for their great violence, known for how many people they killed, but it was for their personal power. It was for their own good, their own desires. And so what we see in Genesis 6 is a world that glorifies sex and violence. A world where men thought it's going to be through the number of children I have and the number of women that I rule over and the number of men that I kill that I'm going to make a great name for myself. And God is describing this in Genesis 6 that this is not just boys will be boys and this is how men behave, but he's saying this is the result of demonic powers and manipulation and control of humanity. And that the whole world was filled with this. Every inclination of their heart was evil continually. Except for this one man, Noah. Noah walked faithfully with God. 
Hebrews 11, verse 7, it says, By faith Noah, warned by God about events as yet unseen, respected the warning and built an ark to save his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir to the righteousness that is in accordance with faith. Verse 9 tells us that Noah walked with God. He's walking with God when no one else is. He's living faithfully when no one else is. The rest of the world is looking to glorify themselves, to, to build themselves up through sex, through violence. But Noah has a heart to please God. And this heart to please God, this walk that he has, it says in Hebrews, condemned the world. That can be a scary thing to think my walk's going to condemn the world around me. We know that people don't deal well when, when they feel condemned. When we look at someone else and, and we see how they're living for, for God with their whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and living for others as themselves, and, and we're not living up to that. We don't generally like that. We, we sometimes want to pull people back when we see them walking with God far more faithfully than we do. And the way that the scriptures describe this is because these powers that rule over people, these evil forces that rule over others, don't want to see people living a life ruled by Jesus Christ. In the biblical description of the world, there, there's just two kingdoms. There's no independent autonomy that I'm just going to choose who I'm going to follow. There's the, the kingdom of evil and the kingdom of God. There's two kingdoms. We're either going to live for God or we're going to be manipulated. We're going to be deceived by Satan, by his followers. And they're going to control our lives. Not through fear and intimidation, but they just seem to have this force, this power to manipulate us, to get to do their bidding, believing that it's something that I want. There's no neutral ground. So one kingdom, seeing people live for another kingdom, is going to put pressure on them to stop doing that. Noah would have felt that pressure, but it still says he walked with God. And as a result of walking with God, he heard from God. God spoke to him. God said to him in verse 13 of Genesis 6, that I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I am going to destroy them along with the earth. God pulls back the veil for Noah and shows him what's going to come. He shows him that destruction is coming from this way of life, this way that these demonic forces are, are leading people into. This is going to lead to the destruction of the world. It's going to lead to judgment. But also God shows him a way that leads to life. The very next verse, verse 14, he says, Make for yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. God revealed to Moses that there is a, a way to salvation. And he says that way, Noah, is if you, if you believe me, believe the words that I'm going to share with you, believe what I'm going to tell you, trust in me and there's salvation. We read those verses earlier from Hebrews 11, 7 about Noah, where he's included in the, in the hall of faith with other individuals in the Old Testament who are included in this group. People of faith. People saved by faith. Noah, in chapter 6, is, is saved by this covenant with God based on faith. God says later in the chapter, he wants to make a covenant with Noah. And Noah enters into this covenant with God by, by faith. And he begins to build the ark. And he builds, builds the ark for years before he sees a drop of rain. But he does it because he believes. He believes in the word that God has spoken to him. He believed and his belief made him righteous. And because he believed and he was righteous, he, he built the ark. The ark is a means of God's salvation for Noah, but it's also the fruit of his faith. Jesus says in Luke 6, 43 through 45, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs are not gathered from thorns, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of the heart produces good, and the evil person 
out of the evil treasure produces evil, for it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. The ark is, is a byproduct, the fruit of Noah's faith in God. Faith that God is just, that God's not going to allow these great atrocities to continue on the earth he created. He created it to be good. He created it to glorify him. And God's not going to allow these individuals who, who feel like taking advantage of all these women, they're going to have not one wife, but four, five, sixteen, twenty, forty, fifty wives, and devaluing those women and devaluing God's view of marriage. That's not just in the eyes of God. And these men who think they're renowned for their physical prowess and being great warriors, God says, that doesn't please me because I see how much death and destruction you're bringing upon the earth. Noah believed that God was just, and because he's just, he's going to put an end to the evil that's happening on the earth. But he also knows that God is loving, and God's going to bring a way of salvation. In verse 6, it talks about how God was grieved from his heart about the condition of mankind. And it says that he was sorry that he had made mankind on the earth. God was grieved. He was broken hearted. He's mourning over his creation. Noah sees God's love for his creation. That he's going to make a way of salvation. He makes a way for salvation and for the humanity and for his creation in the ark. In the book of John, we're told that out of God's great love, he makes another way for us to find salvation. John writes, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. A second covenant. First, he makes a covenant with Noah by faith. He makes a covenant with Abraham. He makes a covenant with Moses. God continues to make these covenants because of his love for his people, his desire to be in connection with his people. And then in the New Testament, when we get to the coming of Jesus Christ, God in his love is going to make a new covenant. But this covenant as well is, comes because God is grieved, heartbroken by the condition of humanity. Heartbroken because there's, we are so easily controlled by the forces of evil around us. Paul Tripp, a, a writer and uh, theologian, says, have, you have to understand the grief of the heart of God to understand the story of the baby in the manger. We look at the, the baby in the manger and the nativity scenes, and it brings us that joy of Christmas, but when God looked down at that first manger scene, Christ being born of Mary, you can imagine what he saw and what, what he thinks about, what brought this about, the coming of Jesus. What brings this about is the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, at the wickedness of, of the people at the day of Noah, the wickedness that comes so quickly after the flood and the Tower of Babel. When Noah sees his people, the children of Abraham, taken in bondage by Egypt. And when God frees them, they fall into bondage to false gods of other nations and idols. God would think about the captivity to Assyria and Babylon and Greece, Persia and Greece and Rome. All these things that he endured when he sees his son born by Mary. We have to understand the grief of the heart of God to understand the baby in the manger. But also the victory that God wants to bring in this new covenant. Jeremiah says these words in Jeremiah 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will not, it will not be like a covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant they broke. Though I was their husband, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. This new covenant with God, this covenant where Jesus comes in the manger, is for him to be born a child and yet 
a king so that he could put his law within our hearts. He could write it on us. He could be our God and we would be his people. No longer controlled, no longer unprotected from these forces of evil that so easily control humanity, no longer powerless against them, but the power of Jesus Christ is coming into the world to claim us as his own, claim us as part of his kingdom. Abraham Kuyper, a Dutch theologian from about a century ago, said that there is not a square inch of the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry out, Mine. Christ came as the child and yet a king to cry out over the world and over creation, over each and every one, every one of us, that they are mine. Christ came to win a victory to free us from these evil forces that so easily manipulate us and control us through their deception. Came so that we could join in the victory. 2 Corinthians, Paul says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ Jesus always leads us in spiritual and triumphal procession, and through us spreads in every place that comes from knowing Him. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, a fragrance from death to death, to another, a fragrance from life to life. Jesus came so that we could be part of this triumphal procession to say to the world that there is a, a power that has come into the world, a king who has come into the world who has overcome the evil forces, the powers that once controlled me, the powers and the forces that once controlled me and kept me in bondage to anger, kept me in bondage to resentment, kept me in bondage to, to lust or to greed or to addiction, whatever it is, that we can say to the world, there's a power that came into me. He was born at Christmas and he has freed me from the evil powers of this world so that I can now live for him. 2 Corinthians 5 says he died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves but for him who died and was raised for them. That Christ came in the world so that we could live now for him, free from those forces that controlled us before, free from the forces that controlled people back in Genesis chapter 6. That's a great paradox of the kingdom of God, a different way of looking at the world, because we see in Genesis chapter 6, and for much of our lives, when, when Satan, when evil powers control us, they manipulate us, but they get us to think that the things we're doing are the things that we want. I'm going after money because I want money. I'm trying to have all these women because it, it makes me feel alive and desirable. I want to be violent and show people how much stronger than I am than, than other people around me so I can get glory for myself. We think that we want these things. Satan gets us to believe that we want these things as he got Adam and Eve in the garden to believe that they wanted to be made like God. And we come under his control. And we're not really free at all. And the paradox comes when we realize that and we come to Jesus and see, Jesus, I, I want to be in obedience to you. I want you to come into my life. I want not my will, but your will to be done. And in that humble obedience, we find out what real freedom is because we're free from greed, free from lust, free from jealousy. Christ is overcoming sin in our lives to bring us freedom in his name. And we can join this victory procession and show people that you can come to a new life in Jesus Christ. And nothing's going to overcome him, not life, not death, not angels, no rulers. Nothing's going to overcome Jesus Christ. He's going to lead you in the victory procession. And that all begins when he comes to earth at Christmas. He comes to win this battle, to win the victory. And because he came and he lived faithfully and he died and he rose again, conquering death, we can join him in that victory today. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father God, we give you thanks and praise that Christ came, that he came as our king because we need a king. We need a powerful 
ruler in our life more powerful than the ones who have ruled our lives before. You bring us freedom from bondage. You can bring us freedom from sin. Lord God, we give you thanks and praise. I ask that you would help us to live faithfully to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you, uh, if you have a worship folder, and uh, there's a little insert in there with our communion liturgy on it as we join in the sacrament. And there's such good news today that we can come before the King, and He invites us to His table. He wins the victory for us and invites us to come and share a meal with Him. Uh, the way that we're going to do that today is when we come and partake in the elements, we're going to ask you to uh, just, you can stand up, but come down the, the center aisle safely, socially distanced. Uh, we'll give you the bread and you can return back to your seats where we'll partake in that together. And then we'll do the same thing with the cup, but each time if you just want to come down the center aisle and go back uh, the outside aisles, back to your seats after you receive the elements. Uh, that's going to be our way of working this out so we can stay socially distanced and uh, safe in this time. But as we join in this sacrament, let's join in it and begin in joining in the sacrament by joining together in our shared faith through affirming our beliefs in God through the Apostles' Creed. You would say these words with me, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And for those who are truly and earnestly repentant of their sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking forward in His holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and lament our sins and wickedness which we have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty. We sincerely repent and truly sorry for our misdoings. The remembrance of them grieves us. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may have ever hereafter serve and please you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all of them who with honest repentance and true faith turn to you. Have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and bring us to everlasting life through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear these words of Scripture as God invites you to his table. The cup of blessing which we bless is not, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. And Christ says to us in John's revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I come into him and dine with him, and he with me. What good news it is that Christ would invite us to his table so that we could dine with him. That final evening that Christ was with his disciples in the upper room as they dined together, the night that he was betrayed, Christ took that bread, raised it up towards heaven, gave thanks for it, and broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat this. 
This is my body broken for you. That same night, Christ took the cup and again raised it up towards heaven, gave thanks for it, and gave it to them, saying, Take and drink this. This is the blood of the new covenant shed for your sins and the sins of many. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's pray these words as we ask to come before the table of our Lord. We do not presume to come to your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your multiple and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, gracious Lord, to partake of this sacrament of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we may walk in newness of life, may grow in his likeness, may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. bread. This is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken for you. Preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ has died for you.
this cup. This is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for the forgiveness of sins. Preserve your soul and body and everlasting life. Take and drink this in remembrance that Christ has died for you. And be thankful. Would you join me in prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. song I ask you to remain standing during this time. Turns my 
given the inside of my chest. I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way. Let's bow our heads in prayer and then we'll ask God's blessing upon you as we conclude today. Father God, we thank you that our King has come. The one who reigns over us but guards us, protects us, who cries out to everything around us. That this, this one is mine. And we are part of his kingdom. We can be free from the deception of the enemy. Lord God, we thank you for guarding over us. Help us to live faithfully through to you to show the world around us what life like, looks like in the kingdom of God. Help us to be faithful. Show everyone how wonderful, how glorious, how fantastic that is. And we can say Jesus Christ is our king. Lord God, we thank you that he came a child and yet a king. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine down upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.